Thank you very much, first of all, for inviting me to give this uh, presentation today. It's been, uh, it took us a little bit of time to organize this, uh, this appointment and, uh, and to find the right time to do this. And as it happens, um, you know, today it is, also, um, it is also a very special day. I would like to speak uh, with, uh, with you today about uh, what we have been doing in the office uh, of Zaha Hadid Architects. Um, uh, myself, as a, now a design director of the company, have been working with, uh, with a group of, of many other people here over the years uh, and really uh, exploring uh, architectural possibilities to um, see how we can make the world a better place, idealistic as it may seem. So the title of my presentation today is Developing Urban Diversity. Today is a very special day because um, it is exactly five years ever since our um, founder and mentor and friend, Zaha Hadid, passed away. And uh, as it happened, uh, we didn't plan it this way, but it is it is, um, it is a, a beautiful coincidence because it would allow us to really show um, a lot of the work that uh, she has initiated and uh, a lot of the things that we have had uh, the chance to, uh, to imagine, to envision, um, to develop and to eventually build. So, um, yes. Um, so, <clears throat> starting first of all with, um, uh, with uh, some of Zaha's ori original work, I think what was uh, enticing for me as an architect was uh, when I was a student looking um, at uh, some of these wonderful drawings uh, with their sense of mystique, but also a kind of a sense of otherworldliness, um, were very kind of seductive moments in in a young architect's uh, kind of mind, because it led to a completely different type of language for doing architecture, moving away from, you know, the idea of an orthogonal projection and the typical drawing that we know uh, has been the case for several hundreds of years. <clears throat> I think this this kind of architectural representation forms a, a shift in the in the way that architects understood space, but also more importantly represented uh, these kinds of spaces. And um, in this particular case, I think the title uh, for this drawing that was developed during the time when uh, the Vitra fire station was being developed, I uh, wasn't in the office at that time, <clears throat> but um, the colleagues who have prepared also these types of drawings were really looking into uh, exactly these new ways of representing architecture and exactly looking into these ideas of distortion and perspective that came along with the type of fragmentation that was often visible and um, and uh, a characteristic of uh, Zaha Hadid's and her collaborators' work at that time. Um, <clears throat> so the idea the idea that uh, you know within within a, a, the, the kind of, how can I call it, the spirit of deconstructivism, which was basically a style that was trying to deconstruct and reconstruct architectural language, uh, came through a spark in ar architectural development that we all admire to this day, a very unique moment in time where, uh, you know, buildings became uh, many other things as much as becoming buildings themselves. So, you know, the the idea of these kind of crisscrossing geometries and and the synthesis of basically elements of architectonic, um, you know, composition that could become in the end building structures that would defy the traditional, uh, let's say, terminologies and also the traditional structural logics, but also the traditional uh, let's say understanding and interpretation of the of the various architectural elements. What is a wall? What is a window? What is a canopy? What is a column? 
have become elements of reconsideration. So, you know, the canopy can feature as a shard and a column can, uh, can, can feature as a bundle, you know, and what is an opening maybe, uh, you know, like a, a cut through the building. So I think with this kind of uh, reinterpretation of the architectural, the classical architectural terms came a kind of change and a radical shift. One of the radical shifts that I would claim our office has produced uh, in, in the world of, of architecture. Ever since uh, I've been here for uh, nearly, you know, 25 years now, a little bit less, but our company has been developing unique concepts um, for every everyone project. And you can see here a small, uh, let's say, selection of projects that we have worked on previously uh, from, you know, the Vitra fire station in Weilam Rhine, the IBA building in Berlin, the BMW uh, building in Leipzig, the Fenno Science Center in Wolfsburg, uh, and many others, uh, you know, that each one of them has a kind of a, a distinct uh, concept uh, that makes it that makes it quite unique. And uh, over the years, uh, with 39 years of practice, ever since I have founded it, and maybe a good uh, you know 21 years ever since the company was created, uh, we developed uh, more than 60 buildings around uh, around the world in 19 countries, and we now have a large also uh, ongoing set of projects that are being built around the world. So going back to my theme and, and the exploration that I would like to share with you tonight, what is architecture in a global context? And uh, I place here a lot of questions with question marks. Um, you know, obviously the, uh, the global culture has a lot to offer in all of the fields that we're discussing here, whether it's a historical, cultural, language, diversities, social dynamics uh, that are different in different parts of the world. The politics vary, the places vary, the environment varies. And I think what I would like to try to do tonight is uh, to make two arguments. One is that uh, the world is a very varied place. Um, but at the same time, there are certain underlying com commonalities that we that we share as as human beings and as as a as a humanity as a total, and that within the architectural endeavor, there are similar recurring themes that I be, I have come to believe over my years of practice. They are, you know, terribly important for the way we do our work as architects. In making these two arguments, I will also show you a number of projects that um, uh, that uh, we've done. Most of them I participated in uh, over over the years, and I will try also to show you uh, taking this opportunity, uh, you know, past projects and and current projects that we are working on. But uh, let's start with with this image from J. W. Turner. It's called Fisherman at Sea. And uh, for many years, I didn't really like, uh, you know, uh, Turner as a painter because I found his um, his paintings very gloomy and also rather chaotic. And um, recently, um, you know, especially during the COVID pandemic, I've had a chance to revisit some of his uh, some of his paintings and personally found interesting how he was painting. Uh, during the, you know, the, the industrial revolution at a time when the whole world was changing, but when actually nobody could really put their finger on what was actually happening. So everybody had an idea the world was changing, the steam engine, electricity, factories, production lines, and all the rest coming out of a, uh, a more uh, rural England into the cities. But then capturing that essence, uh, that, that kind of constant strife and the, and the insecurity, will you make it, will you not make it, I think was perfectly captured in this painting, which also 
the the sun creeping in from the back uh, of the clouds, I think also offers a very hopeful message within a within a very gloomy foreground. So, in that sense, uh, you know, being in the middle of the pandemic, I was also captured by this particular image that was shot in May 2020, so about uh, eight months ago, but definitely after the pandemic had started, when uh, a journalist basically captures this crowd of, you know, demonstrators in Athens, Greece, on May Day of every year, the, the, the anniversary is coming again, the, you know, supporters of the Workers' Party go out in the streets and they have their annual kind of demonstration about workers' rights and basically reminding society and government of the hard-fought uh, rights that workers have been able to, uh, to, to, um, to accomplish, uh, you know, over, over past struggles. But in doing so, I was also captured, and I think this is what the, the journalist, the photographer here is, is, uh, is capturing, that during the time of the pandemic, the chaos of the, uh, the, the commotion that was going on in, in former years' demonstrations now becomes a very much organized type of uh, socially distant arrangement of figurines on the sidewalk. And, and I found this both uh, funny and tragic at the same time. But I think there is a relationship in these two, these two images that we, we, ought to, we ought to consider. Um, so moving forward, what is diversity and what is, what is, why is it important? Um, there is many uh, ways to discuss this, but I think uh, one of the things that, we, that I would like to put out there uh, in the beginning of my presentation is that diversity is actually the thing that distinguishes, uh, you know, humans from one another. It has something to do with individuality. It has something to do with consciousness. It has something to do with, uh, with, you know, a sense of freedom. And and I believe diversity is important because it gives us all the multitude of potential perceptions that the human mind can capture. So in that sense, I think it's important because it tells us something about ourselves beyond the social issues of, you know, identity and other things that are equally quite, uh, quite important. So moving on to, to the next uh, slide, um, I wanted to present to you an animation. This is one of my first projects in the practice. Uh, I worked with, with a number of colleagues on these on this kind of things when we were developing forms of um, you know, simultaneous deformation and, and looking at points of density and intensification by means of simulating um, gravity fields onto uh, architectural or architectonic surfaces. And we were developing this kind of idea of uh, new architectural structures that were able to recreate in, in a prototypical, but also rather primitive, I would say, to some extent, um, buildings uh, that had a different notion of, of how they should be assembled. So it's a, it's a kind of a take on rethinking what a building could do. Um, in this particular case, the Fenno Science Center was a, la a rather large uh, museum and educational center for um, for young kids, people who are still in school, and it was supposed to offer them a uh, extracurricular uh, facility where they could learn a little bit more about the sciences, about uh, you know uh, physics and optics and electricity and all that. But at the same time, because of the particularity of this site, we thought that it was important to raise the building up in the air so that we can liberate the, the ground and create this, um, uh, this open plaza, this covered plaza in the middle of the city. So the way this diagram came about was by carving these lines 
through the side, zigzagging through the side, and essentially creating areas where the building could land on the ground. And by doing that, we, we, we created a building that was lifted off of the ground, but where each one of these, what we called cones, became an area, either a pavilion or an area through which you could go inside the building. So this is a building with at least four entrances compared to the traditional singular main facade entrance that you would have in a classical building. And by lifting it off the ground, it suggests the relationship with the ground underneath it, but also, uh, also in, the, uh, in the upper concourse level where all the exhibition activity is, is going on. So this unusual section becomes uh, in a way an instrument for organizing the activities of the museum but also in some sense, organizing the activities of the city through the museum by allowing, um, by allowing some of these uh, uh, openings to appear through the, the, what would be the building mass. And of course, on the inside of the building, you would have these concrete cones that would lift up in the air by creating cavities. And, and uh, in this case, a double cone, a cone in a cone, where they would go all the way up and support the steel roof, um, whilst uh, on the ground floor you could immediately begin to see the gaps between the building that allows us to um, to create a more porous uh, ground condition that can be used for impromptu events and also and also city events. But beyond this, um, <clears throat> you know, what are the recurring themes in, in architecture? I, I, uh, I think there are a few uh, that have been particularly interesting to, uh, to some of us in the, in the practice and myself and my team. So one of them is this idea of a free space, redefining the public space, similar to what I've shown you for the, the Science Center in Wolfsburg, but also uh, kind of rethinking what is the urban environment and how architecture can contribute through um, you know, strategic interventions to be able to regenerate or to transform the, the public domain in ways that are bringing but, but, but people together by uh, op operating on, on a level of inclusion and connectivity and free flow. So uh, in this particular case, the drawing that you see here or the image that you see here is a satellite view of the center of Nicosia. Nicosia and Cyprus is a divided capital. Uh, the two uh, communities, uh, the Turkish and the Greek Cypriot communities uh, have been separated since 1974 following uh, a kind of an invasion by Turkey and a war. But basically uh, what is interesting here be, besides the politics is that the medieval um, the medieval uh, wall fortification that was built in the 1570s by a Venetian master architect called Giulio Savorniano um, covered, uh, you know, a, a diameter, a ring diameter of about two kilometers wide and created a moat around the city so that it can be defended from what, uh, what was the, the, the oncoming Ottoman uh, Ottoman troops. So the Venetians fortified the city and they enclosed within it the most kind of important assets of that time. So when we came to this project with, with Zaha in 2005, the city asked us to develop uh, a design for one of these uh, areas between the two bastions in the moat and to develop what was, what was to be Eleftheria Square or Freedom Square for the um, for the Greek Cypriot, uh, let's say, side of the city, but one that would become also a kind of a a, a symbol for for the wider area. And um, after many years of of work and designs, we developed a kind of a an intervention which was based on a kind of a a series of two two dimensional drawings one of the bridge that is sitting on top of the moat and then also articulating the moat with highly intensive uh, features so that we can turn it into an urban uh, an urban green park by restoring part of the venetian wall 
by looking into uh, into several uh, ecological issues, including groundwater um, storage and and um, etc., to be able to to transform this site into into what it has it has become today. So the site. We call it free space because, amongst other things, it 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 uh, negates the idea of a bridge which we were supposed to add here that was meant to be a beam or a or a kind of a, a narrow, long element connecting the two sides here. And instead, what we did was inflate the surface of this bridge, create a big plaza that is essentially floating over the moat creating a canopy for the mode below Cyprus as as in, in Saudi and other places gets quite hot in the summer. And at the same time, it allows us, it allowed us to, to create a kind of a condition where uh, the upper level and the lower level of the square become interchangeable with the seasons so that in the winter and the summer, people can use the top or the bottom depending on what, uh, on what the weather is like. While at the same time, the, the square here becomes a plate, not only for play and recreation and seating to the, the two cafe restaurants that are in the, in the territory downstairs, but also to have a relationship with the city hall that, was, that is on the top of the bastion across, across from the square and creating a relationship between what was the Venetian monument uh, and, and also the new the new square of the city. So the architecture becomes a cultural agent for, uh, you know, for optimizing city life and basically updating the city by making it more adaptive to the contemporary needs of the city. So in that sense, the, you know, the, the walls of the, the Venetian walls of the city are no longer a kind of a defensive measure. They are seen as a cultural artifact and a cultural asset. And in that sense, the, the new design comes to complement uh, this, this kind of a endeavor uh, by offering complementarity and in some cases contrast. In doing that, of course, one is charged with, uh, with the task to resolve uh, a whole lot of other subsequent city issues. But I think the way we chose to do this was with a lot of uh, you know, passion and for design, and 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 uh, in that sense, um, we developed a lot of uh, elements, urban design elements, uh, with a lot of by finessing a lot of different elements, whether they were planters of benches or even developing a kind of uh, a very floral uh, pattern of interchangeable hardscape and softscape. Uh, in the in the mode area, so rather unusual feat and achievement for to have a public space with this level of uh, of detail. Um, so underneath that bridge and underneath that square, it's similar to the Fenno Science Center, becomes a space for uh, assembly, a space for congregation, um, for winter events when it's raining, for example, etc. But also for shade and shadow. So. In a way, um, it is a crossing, but it's a crossing on two levels. So the green park flows underneath the bridge and it crosses all the way through. And you can see here in this image how the old city to the left and the, and the contemporary city to the right are mitigated in a way. And they are interconnected by a very fluid set of surfaces that manage the contemporary city life. So you can see a very densified series of ramps and bridges next to the road to the right. These are basically uh, ramps leading cars downstairs into a, into a car park. It's a park and ride system, uh, connectivity with a, with a bus uh, station that is to the bottom side of the image, but then also uh, organizing public events, creating a green park in the middle of the, of the city, exploring the facades of old buildings, old heritage buildings on against this um, pedestrian road that we created on the on the left hand side. So it's really reorchestrating what was a very chaotic environment into something that is driven by 
uh, architectural design to find a new harmony and a new way to explore a very mellow, a rather romantic landscape of organized landscape, uh, landscape features. But uh, talking about all these things, it is interesting to think about how do we progress these notions that came out you know, through the uh, intensive working on a project like this, where one is, is tasked with a lot of difficult subjects, but also, also given a lot of, um, uh, let's say, freedom to propose and also a lot of responsibility to, to resolve these issues. And inevitably that the question is, how do we as architects feel about progress what is it that we think is progress in cities and in urban planning? Uh, what is sustainability? What is resilience? How do we help to create those uh, values and virtues? And what are we projecting into the future? So moving to uh, kind of a second part of my presentation, obviously, bioclimatic design is something that is uh, very interesting for us. A lot of people call it with a blanket term sustainability, but for me, sustainability alone doesn't make a lot of sense. Um, I think what, what resonates in my thinking is the idea of a bioclimatic design, meaning design for buildings or buildings that are adapted to the particular environment and they use the characteristics of the particular environment to be able to create uh, more comfortable internal and external conditions. In this case, for the School of Biological Sciences of, uh, again, happens to be in the University of Cyprus, uh, we've we participated in a competition to develop uh, what was basically educational facilities, uh, but also uh, biological laboratories for testing different things during the university curriculum. So, what we thought would be interesting was to develop the building as, as a series of flat slabs, but within those slabs to install a number of laboratories that have these kind of garlic shaped uh, volumes that you see here over two levels. So that each clove of garlic, if I can call it this way, would host a separate laboratory inside and each laboratory would have a skylight at the top but also by being open roof, it would allow the laboratory to be able to vent passively a lot of the, uh, a lot of the um, you know, air within the laboratory that is typically done uh, through air conditioning. In addition to that, we developed this very kind of intensive uh, mushroom cloud, so almost like a colony of, of mushrooms, but actually what they are supposed to be are uh, a series of tensile structures uh, made of fabric that would basically extend the columns of the buildings out of the building out uh, to the sky and create a series of chimneys that we, we envisaged could uh, basically help ventilate the building passively so that we can negate the, the necessity to use air conditioning day in and day out. Whilst at the same time, by shading this kind of open plaza, which was at the rooftop of the of the of the building, to have a plaza for uh, for the students to be able to uh, come out onto it, even in the in the more hotter um, summer months. So this was the idea of finding one or two elements and using them in such a way so that you can achieve three or four different solutions and and create assets for a building that. Um, that otherwise would have had uh, none, of, none of these elements. A better example of that attempt is, of course, the uh, King Abdullah Petroleum Studies and Research Center in Riyadh. It's, a, it's also a very good example of bioclimatic design that we, that we recently finished in, in, uh, in KSA. And this is basically uh, a building that is developed along very similar uh, you know, notions and values of uh, looking at the desert, thinking about the, the hot, arid climate, and at the same time thinking about the occasional sandstorms that would come through and developing this series of volumes that essentially would be um, 
a series of cells with open courtyards that would at the same time have uh, a series or a sequences of interior exterior spaces that are always shaded but also always uh, open to the sky so that they can easily ventilate and allow light within each part of the cluster. So you can see here that the building is not all enclosed. A lot of these areas are actually exterior. You can see the top right-hand image and also the bottom left-hand image are all part of the kind of the, the canopy structures that are connecting the, the volumes of the interior areas of the building as well and uh, creating a very pleasant and aerated environment within what is an otherwise uh, kind of a very hot and arid, uh, and arid climate. But what else can we do with bioclimatics? I mean, obviously, uh, we are constantly um, asked to develop uh, buildings. And, uh, uh, you know, in many cases, clients want to develop large buildings, in particular plots. And I think, like in the case of the Beko mixed use complex we developed many years ago in, in Belgrade, in Serbia, the client wanted to uh, basically use what was a, a site um, in the, in the, near the center of, of Belgrade to install a rather large program. Uh, and uh, there was a, a hotel, actually there was an old, um, uniform making uh, textile factory uh, in, in the site. This is the blocky building that you see on the top of the page. And they wanted to demolish it. And instead we said, no, I think we should leave this building in place. What we did was actually propose to redress it with a new facade. Uh, we, we, we proposed to strengthen and reinforce the structure. And then from it, we, we start pulling out lines, architectural graphic lines, so that we can develop a series of volumes that would allow us to, on one hand, create cascading roofs and terraces for a number of apartments and penthouses, whilst at the same time creating courtyards. And in that way, attempting for the first time to fuse the architectural and the landscape forms into one consolidated synthetic object that in plan looked a little bit like this. So in a way, um, you know, the axis that you can see cutting through the building here was, was an axis that was basically aligning two existing monuments. So we also had heritage concerns to, to do this. So we used all the restrictions that we had on site and attempted to create a new, um, you know, a new uh, synthetic uh, landscape that would be able to deal with a kind of a, a blending of the artificial and the natural form together. So we developed quite uh, strange sections where buildings were pulled down to the ground uh, and by this means creating a series of cascading balconies for, um, uh, for apartments, but at the same time creating this kind of courtyards in the middle um, and uh, and uh, offering a kind of open but protected uh, areas on the site. This is a winter view of the site, which uh, obviously when looking at landscape, one has to consider all the seasons. And I think we're beginning to learn how to look at things in, in, in these different ways now. Um, yeah, so looking at the site and looking at the context becomes an interesting means of, uh, of um, of understanding what we think a building should be. In this case, this is a very abstract plan of the, of the city of Dubai. And what you can see here uh, with, the, with the three black annotations, these are basically viewing lines for the Opus building that we recently finished in, in the city. And this is one of the first, the first um, drawings that we had done when we were trying to orient the views from the building out into, into the city. And of course, the one going slightly to the right and slightly to the top is, is beginning to look at the, the, the Burj Khalifa, um, the business bay, and also the area of the, of the port and the marina uh, on, the, on the other side.
So the building came out, uh, we've talked about this many times, came out from um, an idea, the, the original master plan that was developed by Halcro um, was basically defining these, these plots of land that we see that we see here. And these plots of land were basically uh, supposed to have a six story podium where people could park their cars inside. And then on either side uh, of the podium, there were two towers that were supposed to go 30 meters tall up and sit side by side as a series of uh, twin slabs or, or twin towers. And that was a time when we realized exactly what was not so right with Dubai, because a lot of these buildings, um, you know, on the street level are basically obstructed by these large parking volumes that don't allow for direct access into buildings and also uh, destroy the streetscape. So, you know, the Opus was, I would say, one of the first buildings that really challenged that idea. And, and what we ended up doing was, um, we, you know, we connected the, the two towers uh, that, uh, that we were supposed to have. Uh, we brought them down from 30 stories to 20 stories. So we, we were also kind of implicitly saying, it's not about who goes highest here, but it's about, we, we also ought to be looking uh, about how to design beautiful buildings. And, and we obtained a special permission to bridge from one side of the building to the other. Um, so in this sense, we got to the point where we created a, a sort of what I would call later on a three-dimensional urbanism where the building loops uh, around in section and, and has multiple paths inside through it in contrast to any one of the buildings that you see outside the, the image here, where you have basically a single core going all the way up to the top and they all become basically dead end, uh, dead end buildings. Additionally, what we had done was, was basically looking at uh, the way this, this volume touches the ground. So again, we wanted to lift it up a little bit more and then work through the cube so that essentially um, this project became very much uh, about uh, the aesthetic of playing a, a kind of a perceptual game where the void becomes, uh, in a way, the, uh, the iconic element of the building. Um, and, and I believe that in the process of doing that, we also found a recipe and a way for uh, finding ways for opposites that would in other ways be kind of, uh, uh, how can I say, uh, canceling each other to be able to coexist in a, in, a, in a balanced harmony within this building. So whilst the void wants to eat the cube away and, and make it disappear, and whilst the cube wants to fill itself up and, and uh, diminish the void, I think, at some point, a sort of balance is found and, and things begin to exist in a much more uh, balanced, uh, balanced way. So you can see here on the image how the building stands alone in the, in the, in the middle of, of, the, of the business bay. I think TCOM and, uh, and the city of Dubai have made a great honor for this building to let it stand alone like that and not fill it up with other buildings on adjacent sites. And I think it does it, uh, it brings it into, uh, you know, a lot of prominence by setting it up into the, the urban landscape uh, like this. So moving forward, uh, looking at the way that some of these ideas can be achieved, uh, the structure is fairly straightforward. You can see here on either side of the section, the two cores that are going up. Uh, some of the things that we had to do in order to give the client the area that they wanted, whilst at the same time reducing the height of the building was basically extending that distance from core to slab edge. Extending that distance allowed us to reduce the solar gain within, within the building, but also optimize the gross to net area ratio. And we, we managed to achieve something nearly to 90% uh, gross to net floor efficiency on this building, which is unheard of for, for buildings of this, of this type. But uh, 
so it was. And you can see uh, here the, the six-story basement, the podium has been submerged into, into the ground, into the basement, and that allowed the building to stand freely now in, in, the, in the landscape. Inside the building and underneath this, this glass roof of the void, we developed uh, subsequently a, an atrium, which I will show you in a little while, that became the entrance space of a new uh, hotel by Melia called Mi Opus, and uh, which we also had the privilege to, to work and develop over the years. So looking from that lobby up into through the glass roof, this is to the these these pictures are real, obviously, as you can see, they're not renderings. You can see through the, the building and, and through the kind of meandering lines uh, of the balconies, uh, you can begin to understand and get and get uh, kind of an orientation um, of uh, of where you are in the building just by simply looking up and through that to also see the uh, the lead facade and, and so on. The building, of course, inside also has a series of hotel rooms, which uh, we designed by by the most part, and uh, developed a kind of a, a kind of an aesthetic that is simple, and uh, and casual enough, but also warm and, and rather elegant. Uh, we worked on two themes. One was was called uh, Midnight Desert, uh, and the other one was called Aurora. Both of which themes were were basically a play on trying to bring otherwise unmatching materials together. So you can see the blues and the browns combined in a way together with soft uh, light tones to be able to create a rather a uh, little bit surreal uh, hues of of coloration in these uh, in these rooms. Um, and in this particular building, we, we went through and developed with porcelanosis and bespoke uh, bathroom pieces. Um, you can see the, the mirrors and the wash basins and the, and the fountains, uh, the bidet and the, and the toilets and the bathtub were all designed by us as a kind of signature pieces for this particular, um, this particular hotel with uh, Nokia and Porcelanosa who were extremely uh, enthusiastic as we were to develop these these elements and put them into the market. But we talked a little bit about three-dimensional cities and uh, the Opus being one of the starting points. Um, I think we later on went and developed several other notions with buildings that are not only bridging on several layers uh, from one side of the street to the other, but also Begin, beginning to think about how this kind of uh, three-dimensional cities can begin to give rise to a new type of urbanism, um, especially when the dependency or street-based cars uh, diminishes as we move into the future, potentially with drone technology or other means. Uh, but I think it's also quite interesting to begin to think about buildings as part of the landscape of a city in a similar way that we view um, natural landscapes or mountain ranges or whatever. And in a way, uh, looking at how buildings can offer spaces for multiple programs. So for example, you can have offices in some of these bands. In the two-story volumes, you can have libraries. On the top, you can have penthouses. And really, each one of these buildings can become a mixed-use type of arrangement that comes into the ground in a variety of ways, but at the same time, I think gives the opportunity to organize buildings, not as monofunctional uh, entities anymore. Looking at how we can also approach these buildings toward, uh, you know, natural water elements, using terraces to create gradient decrease of privacy for residents versus the public domain and really opening building up to a much more intensive use than, than what we would uh, otherwise. And also working with more downtown areas, central business districts, where we can begin to think about how, uh, you know, some of these, uh, uh, some of these buildings can house, uh, you know, multiple companies and create uh, kind of new setups for, for, for business. 
So can you hear me well so far? Is everything okay? Yes. Yep, thank you. So uh, moving on from there, this is another project. This is called Tushino. Again, it's, a, it's about the idea of, of uh, producing a residential project with bridging conditions and bridging elements where some of the residences can have uh, you know, green roof terraces, rather large in some cases, but also using these bridging areas as creating uh, areas of civic activity for kindergartens, for small supermarkets, for uh, community centers, so that the buildings themselves are not, as I said, fully residential or otherwise, but always try to bring a certain amount of mixity within, uh, within these volumes. But now looking at this kind of idea of uh, fusing the architecture with the landscape, um, this is a project we've done in China a couple of years ago for a high-tech campus in, in, uh, in the city of Chongqing, uh, fastly developing new metropolitan center in, in China. And they, you know, in this particular area, they have this beautiful, endless, luscious, green forests where they, they wanted to develop a campus of several million square meters. And, uh, and basically our idea was to take this landscape, which was we found was very, very beautiful. And really uh, you see, I don't know if you see on the top right hand corner, the river, uh, one of the, uh, the river running through the side was a little bit farther away from us. So we proposed to connect or to divert part of the river flow in through our landscape and then reconnect it down to the river stream so that we can basically use the area here as a way to create uh, a series of segmented uh, mini dams that would allow us to uh, water the area here to create a kind of a, uh, an element uh, in the valley that would attract people and business here, but also use it as a way to, uh, you know, to replenish and filter water supplies of, of the particular area from, uh, from the water table below. At the same time, uh, you know, we, we looked uh, carefully and analyzed the topography. We use, uh, you know, highly developed topographical digital, uh, techniques to be able to understand these sites uh, very well these days and also use them uh, to develop uh, typologies of buildings that would essentially sit slightly over but also within the ground creating again this kind of courtyard terraces um, so that they they fit within the landscape and they don't obstruct the beautiful views of the forest as you're living in it so these buildings were supposed to be you know, in a way discovered as you as you walk through them. At the same time, by look by looking at the contour lines of the topography, you can see the top right hand image here. We're beginning to propose a series of residential areas that are basically changing in shape as the contour line changes, so that each one of these units is arranged on uh, a flat horizontal plateau. So you can avoid excessive stepping and, and, uh, and other structural and, uh, and uh, um, how can I say, uh, tectonic uh, challenges. So you can see here a series of, of uh, units uh, which uh, are basically flowing together with the topography fitting quite nicely in it and creating a kind of a new hill set into, you know, what we what we envisaged as a kind of a new tech driven romantic uh, romantic landscape as a kind of rediscovering uh, you know the old English romantic landscape in 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 a new form. So uh, yeah, in in other instances uh, we're looking at um, the environment. Uh, so going from desert to luscious green to here in this particular case, a coastal city in, uh, in the southern region of, um, of Russia in the Black Sea. This is a city called Novorossiysk and the Admiral Serebriagov embankment uh, was a proposal we developed for the client who wanted to have a kind of a master plan that would grow over time. And basically 
they, they, we proposed a, a master plan that would develop in seven phases, starting from the right-hand side, moving on to the left-hand side. Each one of these building volumes would be uh, a new phase of the, uh, of the, of the master plan. And, uh, and basically it could be built at any given time so that it looks always complete, whilst at the same time, it always uh, kind of allows for a new building to be added so that there is an ever going expansion on this particular site, depending on how, you know, several uh, economic uh, uh, feasibilities would develop across, uh, across the time. So we offered uh, a series of forms uh, that were not only offering obviously the phasing that I discussed before, but they offered a lot of green spaces between the buildings. And also because this area here has a rather high winds in the winter, we turned the buildings in such a way so that we can create windshield effects with the buildings so that the areas between them can remain, uh, you know, bora bora wind free during these, these, uh, these difficult seasons. And, and the forms of the buildings are not kind of idiosyncratic. They were actually tested several times and formed precisely so that they, they, uh, they, uh, they help the, the public domain with, uh, by, by kind of diverting the, the wind from flowing around. In addition to that, I think it's also interesting to suggest that because this is, uh, a, the sea is one of the most beautiful assets that this site has, we wanted to turn the buildings uh, you know, in, in such a way so that most of the apartments and most of the hotel rooms would have view to the sea. So by turning it 90 degrees against the, the water edge, it allowed us to have 75% of each building looking to the water. Hence why also the roofs are bending down as you go toward the water so that it opens up to the views quite well. I think, you know, in some way the image is very telling. And on the image on the bottom right, left hand side, you can see how the mixed program appears in every volume, in every stage. So you never build only one hotel or only one convention center or only one gallery, but, uh, or only one residential building, but every, with every residential building and hotel, you also bring a cultural or a social program with it so that you have an ever expanding, um, you know, uh, mix of, of public and private uh, uh, offerings. And an overview rendering here. So it's an idea, it's a, it's a way how one can deal with this kind of uh, hostel developments by looking at the, uh, you know, at the particular climatic characteristics thinking about the second row of buildings as well, because through this openness, you can allow for a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of openness for second row buildings to be able to still see the sea. Um, and at the same time, developing a system that allows people to grow it over time as, as their economy grows. Um, and uh, this brings us to another project. This is a much more uh, luxurious project, I would say, but it's one where we are again looking at the landscape and, uh, and uh, we are here on a cliffhanger site where the client asked us to develop a hotel design in the city of Dubrovnik. You can see the, the castle in the back there is, is uh, the old city of Dubrovnik. And this is really on the border between Croatia and Montenegro, a beautiful rocky side with a with a um, cypress tree forest on top. And basically uh, the access to this site is from the top, but there is also uh, a, uh, uh, a, a platform where you see here the swimming pool, um, which is an existing route that we wanted to preserve. So what we did was basically allow car access from the very top of the building. And then everybody goes in and comes down into the hotel floors. That's why you see that the floors are numbered inversely as you go down. And at the same time, we detach the building from the rock. So we don't, uh, you know, destroy the natural rock formation, but we actually made it 
into a feature of the building inside, a kind of a, a, a misty, uh, you know, uh, very kind of fresh and moist type of environment, um, whilst at the same time allowing for a series of gaps between the bedrooms so that we can have light and natural ventilation coming um, coming inside inside the building itself. So the building uh, it was quite a big development. We allowed for uh, the existing pathway. This is a jogging track that uh, people use on the on the on the cliff side to be able to do their exercise in the morning. And what we did was basically develop a, a building like a village, where different buildings uh, and swimming pools by the water, uh, some promenades for little yachts and boats to be able to dock against it, and basically uh, allowing the landscape and the architecture to blend as much as possible in what could be a, a kind of a, a building with spectacular views across uh, across the city of, uh, of Dubrovnik. Okay, so moving from here, we can now go into what we do usually, which is working in office buildings. And, uh, you know, with the pandemic, there's been a lot of talk about what to do with office spaces and uh, what happens to the physical, uh, you know, interaction between people. What do we do with, with, uh, with, the, with the office itself? What happens to the office typology? So this project for, uh, for uh, Sparebank, uh, we're exploring degrees of privacy within, uh, within the office space. So looking how to create a workspace ecology, the diagram at the, at the bottom of the page that shows how different types of spaces of working can actually come together in, a, in, a, in an integrated whole. And what does that look like? So you can see that in some cases, and the collaborative zones, the green zones, are showing several desks around, uh, you know, small or bigger conference tables. The blue uh, areas are isolated working spaces where somebody can take a call or sit and work by themselves for a little while. There is uh, the red zones that are enclosed meeting rooms. There is corridors running through it. So. Whilst it looks uh, uh, a little bit messy, it also offers a very rich mix of, uh, of facilities that can coexist within, uh, within the office space. And you can imagine that something like this, uh, you know, one of the territories inside the office can actually become the area that one project team uses or one department uses to cover all of its needs. So there is, uh, there is different types of working for uh, all sorts, sorts of different types of people. So the way we organize this is by looking at certain, uh, you know, graphs and uh, and uh, using algorithms to be able to understand how different force fields can create boundaries uh, or they can create bridges between um, between different elements. How moving, roaming project teams within the office space can begin to change the way furniture work. And then of course, at the very top, we can see these two conditions where two poles of interaction, two clusters can begin to uh, suggest either connectivity between the two poles or even interruption between the two poles. And we can simulate that so that we can understand in abstract, but we can understand how to organize such spaces by organizing furniture and by using circle packing techniques to be able to organize the different um, the different project teams within within a large organization so uh, we can have different ways of of working stratifying the furniture in parallel arrangements or using more polar geometries to be able to cluster them in different ways and of course we're not doing that for fun Actually, it's very hard work, but what it does, it allows us to also begin to consider what is the interactivity between two co-workers in this kind of scenario. I hope you can see my mouse, or in this type of scenario. You know, So whether you have a person in front of you or away from you, whether you're sitting in a row with parallel desks or whether you're sitting in a star-shaped arrangement, 
we believe makes a lot of difference in how people work and cooperate with, with one another. And of course, the idea here is to uh, understand two things. One is how to increase the engagement of people with the company work. And second is how to uh, create more uh, productive, uh, you know, working environments. And these uh, notions in a way allow us to begin to explore the idea of an office space in a much different way where we're using, uh, you know, fluid densifications, clustering, agglomerations, sizing and scaling of different project groups. And by mixing all of that together, I think uh, we're basically uh, allowing people to have several choices as to where they choose to work uh, at any given moment. I always used to say when presenting this building initially that I've never had two days which were the same in the office because sometimes, um, you know, I need to work on my own. Sometimes I need to speak to a lot of people. Sometimes I need quiet. Uh, sometimes I enjoy the buzz of the of the city, and I think that goes for, of the of the of the office. And I think that goes for all of us, uh, depending on the kind of work we do. But that doesn't mean that we're not productive and ideally creative in all those instances. So this is a building that tells people, you know, that it's okay to be on your own if you need to. It's okay to be with a lot of others if you need to, you know. And I think going through the, the varying moods and, and, and the days that one has in an office, I think the building says, you know, as long as you feel well in your office environment, then, you know, you think you can be productive and we're encouraging that. So it's a lot about softness. It's about a lot, a lot about color. It's about uh, casual uh, working conditions. It's not about being fixated to a desk and expected to crunch out uh, numbers or whatever else day in and day out. And of course, uh, you know, the, the fluidity of the space, this building is rather big. Um, so you can see inside the, the level of openness that is achieved by also carving out a big atrium out of the out of the building. So the unusually in this seven story building, the floor to, to floor height is about six and a half meters, which means that the clear space inside every floor is in excess of four and a half meters. That allows us to bring a lot more light and it's a lot loftier to be inside the spaces. But also um, it allows us to, to penetrate the light in all the different areas of the building. So there is always uh, a good amount of natural light connecting the building to the external environment. The mushroom columns that you see here are, are basically structural uh, columns. And uh, by using these, uh, besides the central element that holds the roof up, I think you can also see that the building features a number of open web uh, columns that are basically allowing us to capture uh, longer spans between column positions. So although the columns are uh, unusually a little bit bigger than, than the, the columns that we're used to in normal office spaces, it also allowed us to increase the span between columns to uh, 25 or so meters. So this is a very kind of open uh, office space and the column locations operate as, as, as structural elements, but also as wayfinding elements by the use of, of color and light in the building not shown here. And uh, this is what the, the building for, uh, for Sperbank looks like from, from the outside. It's an old glass building. Um, the idea of that is to create a kind of almost like a bio bubble uh, and uh, uh, an area inside the building that is uh, in tune with the outside environment. So it's not all artificial lighting and, uh, and uh, 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 you know, air conditioning, but actually one that that uh, resonates more interestingly with uh, with the ever changing uh, climatic conditions. Yeah, so I have a little video here for you. This is what we developed for the client when 
Uh, the design was more or less finished and it will show you a little bit about the construction as well. So please enjoy. That's the minibus dropping people off to their individual course so that they can go straight to their desk. The building is split in two parts with a road running through the middle, dropping people off. Right, so um, moving on to uh, another project that's discussing the idea of agile space. This case is, a, is the OPPO headquarters in Shenzhen, a project that we are developing now, taking on what we've learned from, uh, from the spare bank building and also trying to explore the, the same or similar ideas in a project that is more vertical in this case. Um, a series of four um, glass ellipsoids that basically house interconnected office spaces inside on this on this uh, particular site in the super headquarter district in uh, in Shenzhen. Uh, Oppo is a mobile company and uh, it wanted to have a kind of a retail center on the ground floor uh, of of the of the area by means of a podium. And then a series of uh, employee facilities, including gallery, uh, a, a large restaurant for two and a half thousand people for, for lunchtime uh, dinners and so on. And then the green areas are the, um, the office spaces and the VIP facilities at the top in the blue zones. 
So the building is developed as a, as a cluster of four ellipsoids, as I said, and because of their interconnection and the bridging floor volumes, we are exploring the idea of having a sky plaza at the bottom of, a, of an atrium that is sitting halfway up the building, whilst at the same time uh, having a double core again in this building so that it can lead us to what is essentially the, the sky plaza where everybody comes into this floor on the 10th floor uh, during the day before they go and get distributed into their offices by finding their way around the atrium. Um, we've, we've looked at uh, similar ideas as with Sperbank as well, to be able to understand how uh, different desk sizes, uh, the connectivity or the visual connection between people can enhance cooperation within the workspace. Uh, we're looking here, uh, doing what's it called a, a kind of a pressure test to try to understand how many people can we fit eff efficiently within the floor plate, but also establishing via an analysis also which are the main routes that would lead us from one core uh, into the other, uh, so that we can maximize, uh, you know, the capacity of of circulation. And here we have another video to explain the project a little bit better. The building is structured around uh, a series of uh, elliptical frames that all together come together to hold the floor slabs up. The super headquarter district. So the building connects to an underground uh, tunnel for cars in the metro station. It has an underground retail zone and also uh, the ground level lobbies for the employees, but also a retail zone in the back. the retail corridors. So a shuttle core brings people up to the Sky Plaza and from there distributes to all the other levels. A large atrium defines the orientation inside the workspaces. And the large window in front of the atrium opens up the building with views to the Shenzhen Bay. The dome at the top overlooks at the sky and uh, offers 360 views to, to the city around it. A big effort goes into rationalizing this large facade, obviously making sure that the panels are small, fabricable.
So this is the OPA project currently on the drafting table. We're working on this very intensely now. Yeah, and um, now maybe it's time to move into a different segment of uh, my presentation. The next section is a new infrastructure. I would like to show some infrastructural projects. This is a project. This is the Sheikh Zayed Bridge in Abu Dhabi. Uh, we developed this with Zaha when uh, in, in the year 98, 99, 2000. And this was really an idea. The client came to us and they said, we want a bridge that will really enhance the driver experience through it. So we developed this kind of leapfrogging bridge that was basically sitting in the water once. And, uh, and uh, by means of these uh, arches that were basically moving from the inside of the deck to the outside of the deck created a very variable experience and uh, and in the way that the structure kind of is is hybridized so it's a suspension bridge whilst at the same time is a is an arched bridge at the same time and you can see here uh, the final result that was built uh, and uh, and also how you know some of these arches were fabricated in, in Holland, in the Netherlands, and they were brought in with the flotillas and then uh, craned on top so that we can suspend the decks of the bridge as you, as you go forward. So these, these led us to, to kind of understand how in a way to resolve, I mean, these are unique projects, of course, it is not something you do every day, but what it does, uh, show is how you can use unusual form to be able to resolve a series of a series of interesting issues. For example, here to allow for areas for you know obviously the boats to come under to minimize. This is a shallow uh, river here or a creek, so it allowed us to uh, work with a much wider um, footing in the water, but a singular one which then allowed us to have the two arches of the bridge on either side developed asymmetrically, of course, but also uh, allowed these arches to, to be spanning in a, much, uh, in a much smaller distance because of the, of the up and down wave of the bridge, basically. It allows the deck to be supported from underneath or the top, um, therefore minimizing the span. So here you have a bridge that is supported in one, two, three, or five sort of shorter pieces, but it allows for larger spans where you need to have them. Another uh, take on new infrastructure um, is uh, looking into the uh, Moscow metro station theme. And in this particular case, the, the Klenovi Boulevard metro station is a competition we won uh, last year and we're waiting for it to, to start soon. This is basically looking at the traditional people's palaces. That's what the Russians call the metro stations that were built during the Soviet Union times. And they were very, um, I don't have images here, but they are very kind of heavy, classical looking buildings with, uh, you know, uh, heavy masonry arches and, and other elements. And what we wanted to do was to offer a new kind of design uh, approach to, to the entrances of these stations. You can recognize here the, the very, uh, you know, widely recognized Moscow Metro M, uh, we, uh, the, the letter that signifies the railway station and also, and also uh, uh, by using uh, glazing and a column free canopy, we are allowing people to understand exactly where the entrance is, how to go down into uh, into the underground to catch the train. One of the important things that we, of course, uh, dealt with here was how to rebrand what is essentially a modernist symbol for, for Russians and Moscovites. So we paid a very particular attention into how to make, uh, you know, uh, the object of the pavilion for the entrance of the metro station very uh, intuitive so that people know where to go very, very easily. The M always guides you toward the train, minimal uh, signage, uh, but modernized 
so that uh, the space anticipates the flow that it will that it will overgo. This is the ticketing hall. As soon as you come down from the staircase, with with LED lights signifying the ways through, separating the movement of incoming versus outgoing passengers, but then also doing something more. Once you come down into the platform, these are axonometrics showing how the platform space is developed. It's a 163 meter platform. And we're taking a series of elements and is instancing them or parametricizing them so that we stretch as you go towards the edges. And you can see that from the center where the column is fairly symmetrical, we develop a series of arrow-like um, uh, column compositions that basically intuitively guide the, the passengers out into, uh, into, the two, into the two exits. The station looks something like this on the inside. So it's highly integrated with smart systems where lighting uh, on the side of the train begins to fluctuate when the train is about to arrive to alert people to the, to the incoming train. Uh, simple signification on the floor. So if somebody crosses over the line when the train is arriving, uh, it would begin to flash, but also uh, integrating lighting within the column so that we can light up the overall, uh, the overall station in this way. So it's a, a smart station from the point of view that it begins to anticipate movement. It, we can use also the lighting to be able to, um, you know, to calm the mood of a very nervous uh, kind of uh, set of people, especially when when many people are coming inside the station and things get get quite busy. So you can use a little bit of music and, and more uh, pulsating, softly pulsating lighting to be able to make this a very pleasant and very intuitive, smooth experience from, uh, from the ticketing hall to the train and, and away from the station. So, you know, these are, these are all ideas uh, how we can use buildings to be able to, in a way, enhance the experience of city life. But then uh, recently, we also had the opportunity to explore uh, an idea of a building that was uh, called a business and a cultural complex. But actually, the program uh, included uh, a series of um, office spaces, a cultural center, an auditorium for 1,600 people to listen to music, a swimming pool of Olympic-sized dimensions, uh, a, an advanced medical unit, a cinema, a connection to the metro station, and uh, a two Michelin star restaurant. So we thought, that's great. The program is, is fantastic, but the side is too narrow because we're here between a kind of a, a highway and a metro line, and also a series of existing buildings behind us. And we literally had a building slot that was 25 meters wide, in some places 30, just about, but also 160 meters long. And we thought this building could have fantastic views to, to the river. And what we decided to propose is that on top of what the client wanted to achieve, to turn the building into a vertical urban landscape. So what we did was we took the existing buildings, we connected them with two um, horizontal uh, bridges. We crisscrossed them with escalators, similar to a Pompidou center arrangement. We brought the bubbles in that signify all the cultural program, the advanced medicine units, the cinema, the theater, and so on and then put the business program in horizontal slabs together with, um, you know, together with the, the vertical arc that is signified by these yellow roots here to show the areas where the public could roam freely or quote unquote freely within the building. So what we ended up with was a space between the existing buildings to the right and the new building to the left where the escalators are creating this kind of vertical ascent, descent condition with bridges connecting uh, to the existing offices, but also creating a large scale atrium that would be able to easily uh, distribute people to the different functions, whether there is a swimming event 
or a, a, a kind of a concert hall going, and at the same time turning the whole building into a kind of a, a shelf of green areas um, so that it, it also becomes a uh, almost like a vertical landscape of sorts. The structural tectonic is, is something very unique um, uh, for, for us in the sense that we, we, we try to show how a, a program that is antithetical to the, the horizontal domino uh, slabs can be combined by, by voiding out certain areas and creating a series of very peculiar interconnections between the cultural program and the business program. So in a way, uh, the building itself becomes the city uh, structure and the, and the city becomes also part, uh, part of the building. So in this sense, you can have very uh, many transitional spaces uh, and, and, and also a high connectivity between uh, the business uh, territories of the of the particular organization, but also why not? In some cases, when the building is empty and everybody's gone home, use some of the walls and some of the open terraces for doing film screenings and having a kind of a, a, a social program that will allow people to use the building throughout the day. Using buildings as public spaces, I would also like to show you one of the last projects I think I have here for today, which is uh, the building for the Sverdlovsk uh, concert hall in Ekaterinburg in Russia, another competition we won recently. Here we're exploring the idea of musical waves as a way to develop a roof, an undulating roof that would hold inside it uh, a series of, uh, of concert hall rooms. So each one of these bubbles here, you can see this is the grand concert hall. Uh, we had a peculiar situation here because the existing building of the Philharmonic was what we were extending, but with a building that was almost, uh, you know, three times the size of the of the original uh, concert hall room that this client had. So in a way, uh, you know, the existing premises, the needs of the client had surpassed the existing premises and they wanted a space uh, that would be uh, equivalent to the skills and the talent and the expertise that the, that the Sverdlovsk Philharmonic has uh, with its musicians and all its musical directors and its composers. So what we wanted to do was basically to sell, set the building behind uh, the existing building this is a section showing how the building is set back from the street. Uh, we extended the canopy and the roof like a like a sideways teardrop so that we can create a canopy covered entrance to protect people coming in from the snow uh, and the rain when they're coming inside the space. But then we also developed the building around uh, a large uh, public um, a large public plaza that could be used not only for the congregation of uh, music lovers and the, and the performance goers, but also could be used for to house a, uh, a, a cafe and a restaurant and also use the main plaza as a space for social activities. So I, I think uh, this could become a destination place in Yekaterinburg. We, we've agreed with the client that this notion needs cultivating also uh, the, the society to, to be able to understand how these buildings can be used in, in the future and how uh, these new rooms in the city become uh, interesting destinations that can offer a lot of flexibility and a lot of, uh, and a lot of uh, new functionality to, to a client with a very beautiful uh, set of people, a, a beautiful orchestra, and, uh, and, and a choir uh, and also uh, music groups for different ages. So the existing building is, is uh, here on the right hand side, you can see it. What we basically did was allowed in the design that the existing building will remain the face of, of this uh, Philharmonic, this organization. And what we do is basically carving out a void that leads us, tells us there is something here but also leads into the uh, 
the the covered plaza inside that uh, that becomes almost like a pleasant uh, pleasant surprise, a place to discover. The inside of the auditorium um, is uh, is uh, kind of a, a wood uh, shell. Uh, it's all shaped uh, after considerable acoustic simulations to be able to allow people in this what we call the vineyard typology to sit all around the orchestra. And the idea here is that um, you know you don't go to to the performance hall only to to listen to the music, which is the the primary purpose, but also to be able to see the musicians, to see the instruments playing, to be part of this uh, of this theater of the performance, and and in fact to be able to enjoy a very beautiful social uh, social event. So the way I sometimes explain it to our team, it is like we are building a kind of a musical instrument. It's just that in this case, it is. It is a, a kind of a, a larger shaped guitar or a larger shaped piano, but I think this is what we do as architects. We we try to uh, to create uh, the spaces and the objects where these um, uh, these activities can can take place. So based on on all that I've shown you, I, I've tried to take a kind of a uh, a path and a walk through a, a number of different buildings that uh, we've had the pleasure to work on so many years. And that leads us to a, a series of uh, master plans. I'll go through them very quickly. How we can begin to review the city as a, as a kind of a series of, a series of, uh, sorry, I'm gonna go back, as a series of facilities. In this particular case, we're looking into ways how to invigorate the landscape uh, how to increase the, the height of particular districts to create a, a combination of business and residential zones, but also take what is essentially uh, a purely residential zone of buildings of the same height and really give them central courtyards here that are designed public shared spaces. And then also using a kind of a, a height uh, increase or decrease technique to go from townhouses to multi-story uh, buildings. In this case, in, in particular, it's in Moscow. So we take the traditional urban block, we tilt its roof, we, we open it up so that it becomes accessible and porous from different sides. So we can have terraces for private use for the residents, but also uh, terraces or gardens that are connected to the street directly looking into ways how to hide a lot of the cars and the parking that usually create a lot of ugliness in the streets and then using the, uh, the, the open block now to develop a series of individual buildings that are all uh, kind of coming in under, under one roof condition. And therefore, uh, you can imagine in the city of Moscow with these uh, kind of uh, blocks that were developed mostly after the end of the Second World War and the and the, what they call the Khrushchev, because they were built during the Khrushchev period of uh, of um, of the city, where they developed a very simple, inexpensive system to create mass housing, to house all all the people whose houses were destroyed after the war. And uh, following this this attempt, we're looking into ways how the cities can be updated so that certain issues. Uh, which we noted, namely the indiscriminate or undesigned empty spaces between buildings that are not really used very much because they become blank spaces uh, where the nature grows, yes, but at the same time, I think it becomes a little bit less usable than having, um, you know, this type of designed uh, parks, what we call here in this particular case, central parks with ice skating rings and other facilities that people can readily use and they can also use them to meet people in particular in particular locations. So the idea that cities and buildings and nature can all come together in harmonious uh, use and, and good design, finding that balance between technology and ecology is what uh, one of our theses in the, in the office are. Um, starting from the types of things that I shown you 
uh, where Zaha started uh, kind of conversing on these issues and later Patrick and, and others have been, we have been discussing and developing these notions. And this is really what kept us coming back and revisiting a lot of these projects year after year. Uh, is trying to find some good solutions for all of these elements because at the end of the day, cities are people, people are life, everybody is interconnected to one another and despite the various climatic or, or uh, you know, social or other differences that may exist in the world, at the end of the day, everybody belongs uh, roughly here. So this is, um, this is what I wanted to uh, present to you today. And, uh, and uh, in a way, I also want to thank you for your patience. It's been quite a long conversation. I see one Not hour at all. and 30 minutes. So thank you all very much for your patience. Thanks a lot. Thank you for this impressive presentation. Thank you a lot. We, 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 I will take the questions right away. This question from Ahmed. Uh, he says that he had the pleasure working with you in his master's thesis on different projects. Regarding the diversity in urban uh, projects, Zaha Hadid Architects has unique character that reflects specific design approach. How this character deal with diversity of people cultures and identity of each project and how the future work of the Hadid architects consider and deal with diversity of local architectural languages. Actually, it, it, the same question that I had in mind during your presentation, because you have Zaha Hadid have plenty of projects everywhere, actually. Mm -hmm. Well, I think, I think uh, I've given the answer by showing all the different types of projects that we've done so far. I mean, every one of them is, is built in a different place in different conditions. So what is, um, what, is, uh, what is the way? The world is a differential place. We've been, you know, in, the, in recent years, uh, have been dealing with ideas of globalization. And we've all seen how globalization can do things right, but can also do things wrong. Uh, and uh, the challenges that it brought on on everyone, uh, you know, uh, in in terms of transportation networks, in terms of trade, in terms of standards, in terms of you know uh, how to uh, how to make all sorts of different things work. I think what we are learning and what I take from my experience in dealing with these projects so far is that the world needs to remain a variable place uh, and it needs to, we need to find ways to preserve the, the richness of, of, uh, of life on this planet. And I don't mean it only in, you know, the David Attenborough kind of spirit where we need to be able to preserve all, all life. But I think we also have to find ways to preserve the, some of the, local cultural characteristics, the languages, the cultural artifacts. And I don't think that a language like ours goes against these things. I think we need to find good ways to be able to negotiate the new with the old. Um, I've seen, I think uh, when I shown Eleftheria Square, I've, I've shown an example where this kind of negotiation can happen in a good way. Um, I think, uh, so, you know, we can't only be looking backwards. We also have to look forwards, inevitably. Cities and our needs and our societies and our populations change. So I think we need to keep updating. We do live in a dynamic world. But at the same time, I think we need to be tackling issues and we need to find novel ways to be able to do things uh, to update uh, our cities based on people's needs. I think mm -hmm. this is this is the important aspect here. I okay. had a, an interesting conversation with. I'll, I'll say one more thing. I've had an yeah. interesting conversation with with uh, someone recently, and he asked me, "What is your experience working in in so many different countries?" I said, "Well, you know, besides the the you know the differences that one may find in traveling." in places as diverse as you know, China or Russia or Saudi or Germany or 
the United States. I think there is always something common about people. And, and when, you, when you get to the point where you see what we call their hopes and dreams, how they think they can make their life better, I think you're beginning to touch on something on something interesting. And, and, uh, and I think you begin to realize the, the commonality. You can begin to realize the kindness. You can begin to realize the ability to share, to communicate, to make sense of things. And, and I think at that point is where humanity comes to its kind of most beautiful form. Mm -hmm. we, we have a question here from Clark. What, if anything, can old cities like Paris and London learn from the sustainable development planning or measurement practices of new development, city, uh, development cities, GCC, for example, like Neom, uh, NAC in Egypt, etc.? Mm -hmm. Well, I think, I think there is a lot to learn. One of the things that uh, we've been looking at is how to find ways to you know, for example, pedestrianize a lot of areas in London, because you may find that uh, through walking or cycling, it becomes a lot easier to get between places. When previously, when you were moving with the metro, it, it kind of the whole map of the city got so distorted. Um, and, uh, and, um, and I think this is one way. I think there is a lot to learn, especially because these new cities allow us much larger degrees of freedom in how to re-put things together and therefore we can begin to see what is a new potential that can inform older cities uh, and and to see where um, where certain transformations and certain developments can take place okay so we have last uh, question uh, can you summarize the potential of a curved form buildings uh, can provide compared to rectangular form buildings from a sustainable perspective? It's an interesting question. Yes. I think, I think uh, the, the curvilinear geometries are always more flexible, I would say. They, they are much more adaptive. They can, they can cope with much higher degrees of complexity than rectilinear forms. I have nothing against rectilinear forms. I, I, I like it, but each one of the two types of geometries has different conditions. And, and I think uh, in terms of sustainability, being able to work within a more organic framework, I say this, but at the same time, in the back of my mind, I have somebody like Louis Kahn, who did beautiful bioclimatic buildings with very rectilinear forms. So whatever I say will not be exclusive, okay? And it won't be black and white. But I do think that there is certain elements of architectural design that can be explored within curvilinear geometries that are, uh, that are yet to be tapped into. So fluids, they flow much easier in non-rectilinear forms the way you evacuate smoke or, or ventilate air or the way you shade things. If you study the way the sun moves around the building, of course you can shade a building with a square canopy. But if you have a canopy that responds to where the sun is supposed to be at any time of the day, you get much better results, I think. So it's those kinds of things where you can begin to look at them more abstractly, more subtractively, or you can look at them more specifically and develop forms that are much more reflective of the conditions they are resolving. That's where I think the difference is. Okay, I think we can wrap up now. Um, again, Architect Christos, thank you for being with us tonight. It was a pleasure having you and this um, stunning presentation. Thank you very much, Mohammed. Thank you, everyone. It's been a pleasure speaking with you. Thank you. Take care. All the best. Have a good night. Bye. Bye-bye.